Let's start. Welcome to my talk on USB on embedded Linux systems deep dive. Uh, I'm Marcel Ziswiller. I joined Toradex in 2011. I spearheaded there the embedded Linux adoption and we're doing upstream first. Uh, at times we're top 10 contributors as Tim confirmed again. We're still there. And we're also doing an industrial embedded Linux uh, platform called Torizon, based fully on mainline technology. What are we covering today? I'm going to quickly introduce the USB specification and then we dive right in how that stuff is used on embedded systems. We're going to look at the USB recovery mode, USB in U-boot in the Linux kernel, what you can do in user space, then I also quickly gonna look at some USB tooling. We're gonna have a look at the USB role switching. And then I gonna show some tricks how you can do USB debugging. And at the end, I also brought some hardware here, of course, and I can show you quickly uh, a live demonstration. Okay, the USB specification, most of you probably know the whole Connector disaster that kind of uh, converged to USB-C now. One size fits all, right? Then, of course, we have all the different speeds from the good old days. Low speed, high speed, full speed, super speed, and now all the faster whatever super speed. I think 40 gigabit is the fastest stuff that can be done nowadays with USB 3.2 generation, whatever it is. not. Every year something new. And how does it actually work? So the USB protocol, we have uh, the device, is basically the entity that is connected to the bus. Then of course, there is a configuration, which is about the state of the device, starting at initialization, standby, active. Uh, that this is basically a bundling of a bunch of interfaces. What are the interfaces? Interfaces are basically logical devices in USB and each interface encapsulates a single high-level function. So for example, if you have a webcam, it could have multiple functions because it can stream video, could stream audio, and some of them also have some buttons, stuff like that. And basically for every of these interfaces, it, you then will need a driver that handles it. Then there is also a concept of alternate settings. That's basically that each USB interface may have different parameter sets. So, for example, for different bandwidth requirements, stuff like that. And usually the, the initial state is always the first setting, number zero. And then such alternate settings are often then used, for example, for isochronous endpoints that then have a quality of service bandwidth requirements. So those endpoints are then the unidirectional communication pipe where the data actually is flowing. There is always a control endpoint for configuration to get information, send commands or to retrieve status information. It's, it's only you know, suitable for simple, small data transfers. And like I said, every device has such a control endpoint, endpoint zero. And the USB protocol basically guarantees that this endpoint, the, the data transfers, they will always have enough bandwidth that they can go through. Then another type of endpoint are interrupt endpoints. Those are basically small transfers with a fixed rate. So it guarantees has a reserved bandwidth. That is good for devices requiring the guaranteed response time, such as, for example, human interface, HID devices like mice and keyboards. Note, however, that uh, interrupt in this context here is not quite the same like, like interrupts, uh, you know, we have on SOCs or stuff like that. So, it's not hardware interrupts in that sense because everything on, on the USB bus is anyway, uh, it has to be constantly 
pulled basically by the host. It's not like that that the device could really do an interrupt in that sense. Not. Then another kind of endpoints are bulk endpoints. Those are for large sporadic da data transfers and they basically use up all the remaining available bandwidth that you have on the, on the cable. However, there is no guarantee on what that bandwidth or latency would be. It's basically the only guarantee you get is that no data gets lost, everything will be get communicated. That is typically used where, where you don't have any quality of service requirements, that, for example, for network uh, Ethernet adapters, printers, storage devices, like, like the regular USB sticks, stuff like that. And then where it gets really interesting are the isochronous endpoints. That's now where you can do also larger transfers, but with guaranteed speed. So, Basically, you do it periodically, often, not necessarily as fast as possible because you allocate a, a certain amount of bandwidth. However, there is no guarantee that uh, all the data will make it through. So it's used usually by real-time data transfer stuff such as uh, audio or video devices. But how does data really get transferred on USB. There are the so-called USB request blocks, URBs, and that's basically how the communication between the host and the <laughs> device is done asynchronously using such URBs. It's basically similar to packets on a network, and every endpoint can handle queues of such URBs, and every URB will have a completion handler, so in the stack that's how it's, it's basically done. And then a driver may allocate many URBs for a single endpoint, or it can have a different uh, strategy to basically reuse the same URB even for different endpoint. And you can have a look in the kernel documentation in the kernel sources about the further details. And then, of course, such URBs, they also have a, a scheduling interval, how they then go on the cable. And for interrupt isochronous transfers, the, in low and full speed devices, this interval was one, uh, the unit was one frame, so a millisecond, and on, on high speed devices, this got then uh, lower to so-called micro frames, it's a one eighth of a millisecond. <coughs> so how can USB now be used in embedded systems? Most modern SSDs feature at least a USB port and often also, of course, the accompanying PHY. And as for the signals, there are usually the dedicated differential pairs. So the D plus minus for USB 2.0, low, full or high speed. And on the super speed, there are separate receive and transmit uh, diff pairs. Then there are also some supporting signals that go with that. And they may be dedicated signals or often on modern SSCs, uh, just regular GPIOs are used for that. So there is, a, for example, an ID pin, usually low for host or uh, not connected, respectively pulled up when it's a device. There might be an overcurrent signal. So when you draw too much current on the VBUS, that can uh, basically signal that. Uh, the VBUS usually is done through uh, a special chip, like, like it's shown here, so-called so USB power switch chip. And then the VBUS itself, it's usually an input in device mode. So that basically influences then your connection or, or also suspend state. And such uh, VBUS signals on the SOCs are often not 5 volt tolerant because the IO voltage usually nowadays is not 5 volt, not. And then, of course, you will have to have some kind of a voltage divide or something like that. And then there is also the VBUS enabled, basically corresponding to, the, to when you're in a host role, that because then you have to drive the VBUS, 
to basically to power the, the USB device. And again, that usually goes through such a USB power switch as we see here. So we see here the, the enable uh, signal basically that could be, for example, driven by a GPIO and this field B output here that would have actually trigger when you will draw too much power. And in this case here, they basically use a, a, a resistor uh, with the you know, resistance here, you can actually kind of configure how much that uh, current is. Here, for example, with that 15K, it's configured for one amp. And then, of course, here the voltage comes in and it switches it and it comes out on the other side. Then, what else can be? There can also be external hub and or further phi chips. And uh, often also there are some further designed in USB chips like USB to Ethernet uh, bridges or USB to serial adapters, stuff like that. Then of course, a good question, how about USB-C? USB-C usually takes uh, some special companion chips that take care of this uh, new fancy USB-C signaling uh, that's shown here. On the USB-C, you have the CC1, CC2 signals, the where you can basically do all this fancy, you know, saying what, what exact cable is connected, stuff like that. And usually, that, so there are now chips that basically do that for you. And one way to do that is, is that you basically have a chip that just goes back to the legacy signaling, that that's this, this one shown here. So you, at the end, just get an ID output and you get the VBUS. There are also uh, more advanced such chips that then will use some out-of-band signaling, I2C or SPI, that, that of course you will then, in, in Linux, need a driver for that. That will then, like that, uh, you know, you can configure further things or it, it will uh, signal what, what is connected. And another topic, of course, is the whole power delivery stuff. I did not cover that here for today. We have uh, blog posts and a webinar available actually from my colleague, Peter Lischer, the hardware guy who intensely uh, worked on that topic and can tell you all about it. I have uh, some links in the references. And now, uh, you have two examples here is for example from a TI uh, AM62 Citara chip. You see here it has uh, two instances of, of USB controllers and you on the top here it's the, basically the, the VBUS enable signals. In this case they, they call that drive VBUS. So they are that dedicated uh, signals in this case and then this is the VBUS basically the the input signal that you have when you're in a, in a device role, you can see here that the second instance is uh, basically hard-coded to, to be a host port. So there, that, that signal just is hard-coded, uh, pulled up. And then, of course, the diff pairs. And usually for the whole analog stage, you also have some kind of a calibration resistor. You see here also you have usually various uh, power rails. Then the second example is actually from uh, iDynamics ADM Plus, the, which is a SOC that also is a USB 3.0 super speed capable. You can see how that looks then. Again, this one has uh, two instances and the uh, accompanying signals in this case are just GPIOs. So for the USB enabling over current and also uh, for the ID stuff that it just uses regular uh, um, GPIOs. While there is actually an ID pin here, but uh, if you're carefully reading NXP spec, that is a kind of a lie. That pin doesn't exist. Don't use it. We tried that. It doesn't work. It's not there. It's fake. Anyway, you see here the diff pairs for the USB kind of the legacy stuff and then the two transmit receive diff pairs again they use some kind of a tune resistor and the VBUS signal again in the host case it's just uh, pulled up okay
Now what can we do with that stuff? One thing that is very interesting is uh, USB recovery mode. As most SOCs, they have different uh, boot modes, and one of them can be that it boots via USB. So it's usually selected either by some strapping or fusing done in production. And then the, the functionality, of course, it's kind of built in into the boot ROM or what, what we usually call the initial program loader IPL. And then once such an initial state is loaded, executed, of course, further stages may use whatever other mechanisms not. So you can have some, for example, an SPL that, that you load like that, and then you can also use other mechanisms like uh, we will see later DFU or fast boot or something like that. So again, as an example, NXPI.MX uh, 6, 7, or 8, or Fibrid, they support the so-called USB serial download protocol, SDP. It's basically the former serial UART uh, download protocol encapsulated in USB. And there actually exists two implementations thereof. There is the kind of the older iMix loader or iMix USB one, and then there is this manufacturing tool, MFG Tools Rio, later fancy one, uh, also known under the name Universal Update Utility, UUU. Another example, for example, the TI now, AIM62 Sitara, it actually supports natively in the boot ROM directly this uh, so-called DFU, Device Firmware Upgrade, uh, which is an official USB device class. Uh, it's relatively low speed, unfortunately, for, for transferring large files because it's just using uh, the, the endpoint zero for these transfers. As we have learned, that one is usually meant for kind of smaller transfers, not really to transfer big data. Not. Anyway, on the host side, the implementation is called DFU util, and uh, of course, either using uh, the NXP or TI, usually for convenience, further scripting uh, configuration may be required to, to kind of achieve, uh, you know, if you don't want to kind of manually load single binaries, stuff like that. So also what actual vendor or product ID you want to act upon uh, and, and stuff like that. So. And then, like I said, these different stages, you probably load some SPL first, which then initializes the RAM, and, and you go on, load UBU proper stuff like that. And one uh, thing that uses that is the Toradex Ease installer. It uses the mechanism, this kind of USB recovery mode, to allow loading a full-fledged uh, installer, Qt-based Linux uh, application. Okay, now once you're in, in a bootloader, in U-Boot for example, so how does USB work there? The, the device side, uh, also known as gadget, basically anyway in U-Boot anything USB has to be started manually, so in a regular boot usually it, it does not initialize USB at all. And uh, for the gadget side, you can basically say whether, which functionality you want to do, like uh, DFU, fastboot, or UMS. So in the DFU case, device firmware upgrade, there is config DFU, uh, config command DFU, plus you will also need some kind of a backend, for example, uh, config DFU RAM. We usually only use the RAM one because, like I said, with, with our installer, we just load that into RAM, and then that installer in Linux will, will do all the nitty-gritty details of how you flash stuff to, to whatever kind of storage you have. Then for DFU, also you have some invariant variable. It's called this DFU alt info, and then the, the last thing will say what backend it is, and in this case RAM. And you basically configure here what pieces you have and at what addresses those go. And then, once you have set that, you basically start the whole thing with, with the DFU command and you give it the, the instance number of, of your USB controller. Another one is Android Fastboot, it's pretty common. The, Nice thing about that is, as we learned before, DFU is not quite uh, performant, and uh, fast boot is much faster to load bigger 
images, I guess, especially on, on, the, on the actual Android phones where you can have gigabyte big uh, images. You don't want to do that with DFU, you know, it would take hours. Anyway, you can see here what the configuration stuff is to do that. And then one note is that it will require a bigger buffer. So you have to configure this fast boot buffer address and fast boot buffer size for, for it to work. Uh, there are also further configurations possible, like uh, for par partition aliases, raw partition descriptors and, and such stuff. Or you can override some of, of the regular variables via fastboot. And then you just start it with the fastboot command. Again, you give it USB and the instance number. Another one is the USB mass storage class, the UMS uh, gadget. It basically allows sharing a regular block device via USB. So you see here the configurations again for that. Of course, it, it depends also on the config BLK, so the block device stuff. And the command is just UMS. Again, you give it the device instance of the uh, USB side. And then you give it what interface the block device is and the device number and or partition number of, of your block device. And then it basically will go on and just share that block device. And on the PC side, when you plug it in, it's just like a USB memory stick, basically. Uh, one note here, I, I forgot to list that on the uh, slide here, is that uh, when you have an EMMC with hardware uh, kind of partitions, it, it, there is no way you can share those via UMS. So that's, for example, a limitation that, that it, it won't work with UMS if you want to update those kind of boot partitions. Then on the host side, if you want to use uh, USB device in USB, so that's config command USB. And of course, it depends also on the on actual uh, HCD. And uh, again, USB is not automatically started during startup uh, because also another reason is that it could potentially interfere that kind of in initialized uh, USB stuff once then Linux boots. Therefore, you should manually start it, USB start, and also uh, it gets stopped again before it hands over later to, to Linux. Also, the enumeration is rather slow as it's uh, using timeout, stuff like that. And, and as you might know, U-Boot is not like a multi-threaded operating system or something like that. Not. Uh, one useful command there is USB 3 that will then show you what, what kind of device it found on the bus. Uh, it, it supports keyboard storage, USB Ethernet adapter, and all this kind of stuff. How about in the Linux kernel? There is the USB core, basically implements the USB bus specification. And this is a architecture independent uh, subsystem. And then of course you need a specific USB host controller driver that is, yeah, depends on your architecture and platform. Uh, there are different ones available, OHCA, UHCA, EHCA, and then for USB 3.0, this XHCA stuff. And then for the actual device, you will need a USB device driver. Uh, that is, again, platform independent, but specific to the actual peripheral used on the USB bus. Then on the device side, you need a USB device controller, UDC. So this is architecture and platform dependent again. So depending, for example, on your SOC, what, what implementation you have there. And then the actual functionality that you will do as the USB device is the, the so-called gadget driver. Again, this one is platform independent and the, the, there are different drivers, for example, for Ethernet, serial or storage, so, such stuff. How does it work in user space? There is the, the PROC bus USB devices where you can see what, what the, the bus is actually doing. The one nice utility is the USB utils. So it has, for example, LSUSB that lists you all the details about uh, 
all your devices. There is also a tree-like view available with minus t, respectively dash dash tree. And there is also one called USB dash devices, which prints all the USB device details. And there is also a utility called USB hit dump that allows you to dump for, for the human interface devices, the, the actual report descriptors and streams. And a nice uh, graphical one that basically uh, shows all this information is the USB view application, uh, which is a GTK plus 3X uh, graphical application, which I also show here a screenshot. Another interesting thing from user space is basically if, if you have an application that wants to actually, you know, do stuff on USB, transfer things or so, you can use libUSB, it's, it's very commonly used. It's a cross-platform library, so it's even available on like Windows or Mac or stuff like that. So it, you can uh, yeah, create very generic applications for, for USB communication. It's basically C library that, that provides generic access and uh, it facilitates uh, the, the production of uh, such uh, USB applications. Very portable, like I said, and uh, it's, it's really running in user mode and doesn't require any other privileges or anything. <laughs> but uh, depending on the OS, of course, it needs some kind of a low layer thing to be installed before that works in user space. No? Another interesting uh, tool is the U-Hub control. It's basically uh, for USB hub per port power control that can be very useful also in embedded devices. It's basically the standardized way how you could uh, on a hub uh, every single port separately power on and off. But of course, it will require a hub which actually implements this. So this is not, uh, you know, the, the USB spec cannot uh, enforce that that it does that. So you have to find out whether your particular hub does that or not. The ones we have on our carrier boards, they usually are capable of doing that. Then a quick word on USB tooling. So. Also, a lot of useful tools can be actually hooked up to your notebook or workstation via USB. Uh, of course, most uh, common thing is the serial adapters, not nowadays who has a real serial port. Uh, mostly it's just a USB to serial uh, adapter. Another thing is kind of, uh, yeah, because USB is, is sometimes a little tricky and you might want to know what is going on. There are also analyzers to analyze USB that are connected by USB, of course. How else would you connect it? So one of the, the kind of uh, ubiquitous used one is, is the so-called Beagle. And another thing I found, which I thought would be interesting to mention it here, is the Syntheon. It was formerly called Luna. It's basically an open source, open hardware project that uh, is basically a multi-tool for building, analyzing, and hacking USB devices. I heard some rumor that uh, next month they will ship. It, it was kind of a, a you know, a, a project on, on some of these uh, uh, sites, not, and the first ones should ship next month. Then another uh, thing that often is used is uh, CAN analyzers. They can be, like the, the peak or stuff, can be connected by USB. There are also USB logic analyzers, very interesting. Maybe the guys that were in Marex call yesterday, he also talked a little bit about that, not. There, there is one that is often used is the Salea logic. I personally actually uh, using the Dream Source Lab one. It's a very nice one. Also, the whole uh, software is fully open source. It's basically Sigrog based uh, uh, software. And the same goes for there are also oscilloscopes uh, that you can connect like that. Okay, now we have a quick look at the USB role switching because that is something that is often uh, you have in embedded devices. So you basically have a port that can be either device or host. Uh, one way to configure that is, of course, in the device tree, you can hard code it. 
There is the DR mode property. As you can see here on the right, you can just, for example, for a host only port, you basically set the DR mode to host and then it's just host. But you could also set it to, to device, then, then, or actually it's peri called peripheral, and then it will be a peripheral only port. Another way to do it, like we saw in the whole pin stuff, is that you have an ID pin. And one way to do that is using the XCON framework. We do that, for example, for the Colibri IMX6 and 7 upstream. It's documented here. It's basically a vir virtual device that is used to, to generate those USB cable events or states. And uh, in the device tree, it uses this compatible and then you can set either ID GPIO and or the VBUS GPIO. You have uh, again an example here. So you have this XCON thing uh, where you have an ID GPIO set, of course, to the pin control for it that, that configures it for a GPIO. And then in the actual USB node, you have to reference it. You say XCON and you have here two values. The first one would be the VBUS which we don't have, and the second one is then the ID pin. Please note that this XCON stuff is considered obsolete. So I guess once we have time, we might also uh, convert our Colibri stuff to use the, the new fancy stuff called USB connector subsystem. Another subsystem. So we use that, for example, on the, on the ADEM Plus. Uh, again, it's documented in this YAML file and it uses a GPIO to basically have a connection detection. And uh, there is also, similar to the ID, there is also a VBUS one, which is done in this kind of a FI driver. And the compatible for it is shown here. And uh, yeah, Basically, also it has an ID GPIO and or a VBUS GPIO. And you can also give it the VBUS supply. So for when it's uh, in the host role, that uh, it uses this uh, regulator to, to, to drive the VBUS. The full device tree you see here, basically in the USB node, you have this connector node where you give that compatible the GPIO and all the other stuff. Okay. Then how does it work with USB device functionality? This is basically the kernel configuration. It's the USB gadget function nowadays configurable through the configFS. What is this configFS thing? This basically is a user space driven kernel object configuration. Uh, so it's a RAM based file system that provides the, basically the converse to SysFS functionality. So where SysFS is basically file system view on kernel objects, configFS allows you to actually instantiate kernel objects from uh, user space. Not. So there are two types of configFS attributes, the normal ones, which are just small ASCII text files, and they can also be binary attributes. And the USB gadget configFS is basically an interface to allow defining arbitrary functions and configurations to define such application-specific USB composite devices. And I quickly show here how that is done. Make sure it's mounted to your configFS and then you basically, uh, when the USB gadget configFS is supported, it will automatically already have this USB <coughs> gadget folder there and then you can create a G1 directory and you can, that creates a new gadget thing. You write your product IDs and your strings as is shown here and then you can create such a function instance in this case. So you create the configuration and then uh, you, in this case, it's called win NCM. So the, this uh, network uh, class thing. And then you hook that up via a link to your actual USB uh, UDC instance. 
And now, if you were wondering what the hell do I do, have to do that like manually, of course, there is also a way to do that programmatically. It's called USB, uh, libusb gx. Then for the host functionality, and now the more interesting stuff about the debugging. So to debug on Linux, it's uh, called the USB mon. It's a kernel facility that allows you to collect traces of I.O. on the USB bus, and then probably you want to visualize that. There is, for example, the virtual USB analyzer. Unfortunately, I think that is a abandoned obsolete project, but uh, yeah, you can just use Wireshark. And I show here how you can do it on an embedded device. Of course, usually you don't want to run the whole Wireshark on the embedded device, but you can just SSH in, and DHCP dump has actually the functionality to, to do the tracing of USB mon things and then pipe that through the standard out in the standard in and Wireshark will then display that. That looks like that. And I can now also quickly show that on a live device. So I have here a board available, I power it on. So it, it is running some kind of halfway new stuff and uh, we can, for example, uh, mode probe the USB mon stuff and once you do that, you can um, list what TCP dump now knows about that. I can also plug, for example, a USB stick in here. So you see that it goes on the bus two here. That's the number the, 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 the here that it shows, not. And so I can then, let's see, I have another terminal. So on the host side, I now just SSH in and then uh, will forward that to uh, Wireshark. There you go. We can stop it here and we actually see here. I mean, this is a USB memory stick, so uh, you can see here it does some SCSI transactions and, and you see here, ah, that's just bulk transfers on the USB bus node. Okay, very good. That was it for my talk. Let's uh, get back. We have maybe a minute if there are any questions. Anybody? Thank you. Uh, so on one of the first slides there was a list with the speed supported and I think there's a small mistake because uh, high speed is 480 megabits and uh, full speed is 12 megabits. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. I can also correct that in the slide and update it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I know something about ConfigFS because I sure. converted most of the functions, USB functions, to use ConfigFS. Uh, so uh, maybe people got an impression that you create arbitrary functions with ConfigFS, which is not exactly the case. You can select out of uh, the avail available repertoire. There are are about 20 USB functions such of as course, yeah. various flavors of Ethernet, audio, uh, human interface, mm -hmm. uh, mass storage and so on. And exactly. So you need to have that, of course, configured. It will not just magically win N NCM. I mean, it needs they need a driver to be somewhere that knows yes. what to do with that. Yes, yes, correct. yes. But, but if you really want your custom, completely custom function, which does not belong to any USB mm -hmm. class, you can use a fun another function which is called FunctionFS, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which exposes a uh, file system interface to user space and then you implement your custom USB function mm -hmm. in user space by reading, writing or polling mm -hmm. the files in that file. That's system. kind of like Fuse or something like yeah. that, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>